Okay, so today we are talking about allergic reactions. Um, we're covering chapters 22 and then hopefully 23. Oh, nice. He cuts out all the slides that don't matter. Okay, so allergic reactions. Um, basically, allergic reactions are normal. Let me scoot back a little bit. Um, your immune system does these already um, naturally for any foreign substances in your body. And it's completely okay to have an allergic reaction. Um, you know, basic things like ant stings, um, poison ivy, you know, those are common allergic reactions that a lot of people have. There are some people who aren't allergic to, say, poison ivy, and so they don't have the same sort of rash and itching and everything that the vast majority of us do. Is anybody in here, do you know if you're not allergic to things like um, ant stings, poison ivy, stuff like that, if you don't have a reaction? Not ants. You don't have a reaction with ants? Okay, you're lucky, because I do. I get, like, they're actually pretty bad for me. I'm not, like, truly allergic, like, bad, but definitely not normal for me. Um, allergic reactions can also be exaggerated. Um, you know, your body naturally deals with those intruders, but it often goes a little bit overboard. Um, so your body should be able to flush out all of those intruders pretty easily. Um, it's just when you start to have the itching and everything like that, it's because your body's working in overdrive, basically. It's getting more affected by um, the foreign substance, and it's causing this bigger response. Um, the foreign substance, we call those allergens. Anything that causes an exaggerated effect, anything that causes an allergic reaction is an allergen. Okay, so um, you're, for your first exposure to any allergen, um, you're not actually allergic to it yet, or rather you don't know if you're allergic to it yet. Um, you're, the very first time you're exposed to something, your immune system forms antibodies to it. Um, it doesn't know how to deal with it yet, so it kind of figures it out as it goes. Those antibodies will attack whatever that allergen is. Um, antibodies are created specifically for a specific allergen. So they don't just attack anything in the body. They specifically attack, say, the antibody for an ant sting or an ant bite specifically will attack the allergens um, from that ant sting or that ant bite. Like it says, they combine only with the allergen they were formed in response to. So the first time, you're not actually going to have any sort of allergic reaction. Your body's just going to handle it, um, deal with the allergen, and it's over. But the second time and any time after that, the antibodies are already there. They're already kind of ready for this attack that's going to happen. And so when they um, sense the allergen, they go into hyperdrive. And they uh, combine with the allergen. They release a lot of chemicals, histamine, other chemicals. So if anyone's ever taken a Benadryl, it's called an antihistamine. That's what it's doing. It's blocking those histamine receptors. So hopefully they don't um, get the histamine and start reacting. That's one of the chemicals that causes a big allergic reaction. So those chemicals cause harmful effects, all kinds of things that we're going to talk about. Um, inflammation, swelling. Um, swelling is also accompanied sometimes by edema, which is fluid buildup. Um, bronchoconstriction, which means what? Yeah, so your bronchioles, your airways are constricted. Um, that's also usually caused by the swelling. The, the tissue is pushing in on the spaces and making it harder to breathe. And then vasodilation, what's that? Yeah, uh, blood vessel dilation. So blood vessels getting bigger um, in response to all these chemicals that are in your body that shouldn't be there. Okay, and anaphylaxis specifically is a really bad allergic reaction. So allergic reactions already aren't awesome. Um, anaphylaxis is just a whole lot less awesome. Everything is much more extreme. So um, your blood vessels dilate, that vasodilation, um, which leads to hypotension, which is low blood pressure, okay? Um, and that's bad. Why? What can that affect? Uh, well, okay, it can affect your whole body, but we're especially talking about heart stuff. So if your um, blood vessels have dilated, your heart is having to work a lot harder to push blood through and still get it where it's supposed to go. If your blood pressure overall has dropped because those blood vessels are larger, it just puts a whole lot more pressure on the heart to do what it's supposed to do. Um, again, airway swelling, that bronchoconstriction, um, your airway is swelling up, your bronchioles and everything are getting smaller. It makes it a lot harder to breathe. You can get some airway obstructions. Um, you can eventually go into respiratory failure if it completely closes off. That's, that's reasonably common in anaphylaxis. So that's why it's so dangerous and that's why we learn about it. Okay, common allergens, um, insects, bites or stings, um, foods, plants, Medications, um, you all have wondered about some medications that people can be allergic to, like aspirin and stuff. 
Um, you can be allergic to a lot of stuff. Dust, you know, dander, cat, whatever. Um, chemicals that are in soaps and cosmetics and things like that. Is anybody in here like really allergic to something? Or even just mildly allergic to something? I'm allergic to the pertussis vaccine. To the what? Pertussis vaccine? Mm -hmm. Okay. That happens. Anybody else? Clorox. Clorox? Okay. <laughs> something in the bleach? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm pineapples. Pineapples. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's not one I've actually heard before, so that's that's cool. Anyone else? Grass, like just in general, the. Uh, I've gotten that sometimes too. I kind of have sensitive skin, and so yeah, if I get too close to something like that, like oh, it's terrible. Oof. Like my skin is actually crawling right now thinking about it. You had your hand raised. Oh, I'm allergic to chocolate. Are you chocolate and penicillin? Okay. <laughs> That kind of stinks. I had a friend who was allergic to chocolate and peanut butter, so she could never have a Reese's. That's sad. Also, she could never have peanut butter or chocolate separately, but like, when I think of those two together, I think Reese's, and then I get really sad for her. Um, <laughs> so what do you do on Halloween? I mean, I can eat a little bit of chocolate, like, just not, not like straight chocolate. If it's like something like milk, it's like chocolate milk, that's fine. Okay. But just like, like a, bar. a ton of chocolate just doesn't work for you. Okay. Interesting. Um, and, uh, some other common food allergies are like, uh, well, okay, peanuts, any other kind of nuts people tend to be uh, allergic to. And if they're allergic to one kind of nut, they're often allergic to other kinds. Um, same thing with some insect stings. If you're allergic to bees, you may also be allergic to wasps. Some of them kind of go hand in hand like that. Um, one exception that's worth noting is peanuts. Peanuts are not actually a nut that grows on a tree. So you won't be, generally, you won't be allergic to peanuts and almonds or something. Um, they're not actually the same kind of food. They're not the same um, from like a biological standpoint. So you won't necessarily have the same reaction to both. Okay, so um, for an allergic reaction, we can't actually predict what's going to happen. Even if you are really badly allergic to something, um, it can happen fast, it can happen slow. It depends on a lot of factors. Um, it can be really bad or it can be, you know, not so terrible. Um, Usually, if it's a severe reaction, it's going to happen really, really fast. Uh, peanuts are a really good example of this. If somebody is allergic to peanuts and they are exposed to peanuts, it's usually very, very quick. We're talking like a minute or less. Um, immediate reaction, immediate problems with breathing and everything else. Um, sometimes they can d be delayed more, kind of depending on the allergen. Peanuts, like I said, are especially quick acting. Um, other nuts and other things may take a little bit longer to kind of have the full effect happen. It can start off slow, and it can quickly turn into anaphylaxis, anaphylactic shock. OK, so some signs and symptoms um, that we would see. First, obviously, they are itchy. <laughs> um, that nearly always happens. Um, you're going to see some swelling of the tissues. Um, it may be all over the place. It may just be in the localized area that they were exposed to whatever the allergen is. Um, you're going to see flushing, which is the red skin. Um, they may have a warm, tingling feeling um, in their face, um, in their fingers, in their feet. Um, kind of, it's kind of a weird sensation um, that has been reported by people who have it. Um, you're also going to see probably hives. And this picture doesn't show them super well. Um, you can look up other pictures for them online, and I know there's at least one in your book. But it's basically like the red, raised welts. Um, they can be right around wherever the actual localized exposure was, or they can be all over the body. They can be systemic. Uh, from a respiratory standpoint, tightness in the throat or in the chest, we talked about that swelling, talked about that immediate respiratory um, compromise because of exposure to an allergen. They may start coughing, um, sneezing, anything like that. Um, their breathing may become faster, labored, which just means they're having to work harder to breathe. Uh, it may become noisy. If you look down towards the bottom, uh, strider. Have you all learned the different breath sounds? And what, okay, so do you all remember what causes strider or, or what it sounds like? Okay, um, it's kind of a, a harsh, like, crowing noise. Um, it happens on inspiration, so when they're breathing in, you'll hear it. And it's caused by upper airway obstruction. So, um, again, that just means that their airway, upper airway is from the voice box up. So something up here, not in the lungs, but up here, is constricting. 
and causing obstruction, and it's making the, um, the air kind of basically whistle as it moves through. Another breathing sound that you might hear is wheezing. Where does that one come from? The lungs. Uh, you're going to hear wheezing from the lungs. That's lower airway obstruction. And again, kind of same, like, whistly um, sort of sound as they're breathing. You may also hear hoarseness in their voice, um, loss of voice, muffled voice. And again, that's because their whole airway is being messed up. So their vocal cords, everything that's used to normally produce sounds is just being altered. Um, any questions? Uh, from a cardiac standpoint, you may see, or you will see if it's anaphylactic shock anyway, you'll see increased heart rate, and you'll also see decreased blood pressure. Um, these are not necessarily bad, um, I mean, under certain circumstances, but for this, they definitely are. Um, the body, again, is having to work harder. The heart is having to move faster in order to hopefully maintain the same sort of blood going everywhere in the body because of that decreased blood pressure. Um, and overall, talked about being itchy. They may also have like itchy, watery eyes, runny nose. Um, you know, some of the symptoms that you have when you have an allergic reaction to just the pollen in the air or something like that. Um, headache, and then the one that's kind of interesting is a feeling of impending doom. A lot of people who have really severe conditions, you see this sort of feeling pop up in people um, who have cardiac issues and have a cardiac um, arrest or are having a heart attack. Um, they say that they feel like they're about to die, or the feeling of impending doom pops up. And it pops up here, too. Um, other things you may find, specifically for anaphylactic shock, if they've gotten to that point, altered mental status. Um, their skin will be flushed and dry, or possibly pale, cool, clammy, kind of depending on how they're being affected and what stage of shock their body's in. Um, I don't think we've, y'all have gone over shock yet, but shock has to do with hypoperfusion, which is like low blood, um, movement in the body, and shock can cause both of those conditions depending on how far the shock has gone. Um, nausea and vomiting is a common reaction to anaphylactic shock or to um, massive allergic reactions. And then increased pulse, de decreased blood pressure in their vital signs. Um, how to distinguish the two. So any of those things can happen with a basic allergic reaction. Um, though, you know, depending how bad it is, that's why we talk about how every allergic reaction is different. But the thing that distinguishes anaphylactic shock from just a regular allergic reaction is either that your patient has respiratory distress, so what would we see in them then? If your patient is having respiratory distress, what would you be looking for? Or what would you be seeing? Okay, so cyanosis. What else? I mean, we listed some of them, but just I want to make sure that you guys caught them. Respiratory distress means they're having trouble breathing, right? Okay, so okay, so we talked about wheezing. We talked about those breath sounds. Um, labored breathing, rapid breathing. Um, you know. Yeah, that that's tied into it. Um, their their body's working harder. The increased respirations and increased. Um, Heartbeat usually go together. You may also see um, signs of them really like struggling to breathe better. So um, you might see a patient tripod. Have you all talked about that position? Okay. Um, you might see them having to use more of their accessory muscles, like in their neck and um, between their ribs. Um, in patients, you might see more like nostril flaring. Again, it's all those signs of that they're trying to get as much air in as they can and they're still having trouble. Those are signs of respiratory distress. Um, so either they have signs of that or they have signs and symptoms of shock. And shock is, again, hyperperfusion. It's low blood flow through the body as a whole. Um, so, you know, we talked about the um, decreased blood pressure. Um, some of the other things we talked about, the flesh, dry skin, the pale, cool, clammy, um, altered mental status, those are signs of shock. Uh, changes in body temperature and skin condition and things like that. Okay, so if you suspect, well, first off, you should suspect allergic reaction if your patient has been, um, potentially, if, if you know that they're allergic to something, if they've been in an environment where they may have been exposed to allergens, um, or obviously if you see those 
uh, respiratory distress, things like that, you should at least suspect there might be an allergic reaction happening. So while you're assessing for it, um, you want to ask those questions, but you also want to do your basic patient assessment, which starts with airway breathing and circulation. So uh, what might you see in a patient that is having anaphylactic shock as far as airway? Okay, um, that's probably what would be happening on the inside, but from the outside, how would you, what kind of signs might you see to look for as far as the patient assessment goes? Okay, we talked about those breath sounds. Again, um, re-emphasizing those because that is a sign of airway obstruction. Okay, um, your patient is probably going to be able to talk assuming you get to them early enough eventually there might be complete airway obstruction, but that's what you look for to see whether they're breathing um, and, and how that sounds as regards the airway. For breathing, obviously you want to know if they're breathing fast or slow, deep or shallow. Um, again, those breath sounds, you may want to actually listen to the lungs, get a better idea of what's going on there. Um, going back to airway for a second, the other things that might be obstructing the airway besides just swelling, if they vomited, might be obstructing the airway. Um, if they've got a lot of mucus production, because that kind of tends to go along, we talked about runny nose and stuff, um, that might also be causing airway problems. So be aware of those. And then circulation. What might you see in a patient that is having anaphylactic shock? We talked about some of these as well. Okay, cyanosis. What else? Say it again. Okay, yeah, so... Um, flush, dry, warm, or possibly pellicle clammy, depending. Um, talks about circulation is not just skin condition. What else is it? Okay, pulse. So what would you be looking for as far as a pulse? Rapid pulse. Rapid pulse, yeah. And also decreased blood pressure. Those are all kinds of things that tie in along with circulation that you could assess. Um, you'd also move on and make sure that you got the history and physical exam so especially because if you're suspecting this is an allergic reaction based on what you've seen, there are certain things you'd want to find out. We've talked about sample. Um, I mean, have you all talked about the sample questions, SAM? Okay. And A stands for allergies, but you don't just want to ask, what are you allergic to? That's, that's not really going to be enough when you know they have an allergic reaction. Um, you want to know what they've historically been allergic to. People can kind of outgrow allergies. Um, they can change over time. People, you can have allergy shots that you take regularly, like go to a, a doctor for it. They can eventually, basically what they do is they like stick you with whatever you're allergic to. And slowly over time, it's supposed to help um, raise your resistance to it and kind of decrease your overall reaction to the allergen. So um, those can change over time, and you want to know the whole history of what they are allergic to, what they have been allergic to, things like that. You'd also want to know for this particular time, what was the patient exposed to? What do they think actually is causing this reaction? Um, so if they know they're allergic to bee stings and they got stung by a bee, that's something worth finding out for sure. As well as how were they exposed? Um, or there was a, you know, if it's peanuts, for example, did they actually eat some? Were, um, did they eat some food? Was somebody near them eating peanuts? Sometimes people have really, really bad allergic reactions and um, if I eat a peanut butter sandwich and I go and I'm talking to them and my breath is hitting them, it's got enough of the allergen in it that they're super allergic to that they can have a real reaction. So um, how are they exposed makes a difference in terms of how bad it's probably going to get and how we treat it. Signs and symptoms, we've talked about the kind of things that you'd see in a patient who's having um, anaphylactic shock. Okay, progression basically means... When did it start? How did it start? So was it a slow thing? Did you eat something two hours ago? Did you eat it two minutes ago? Um, are you all of a sudden not being able to breathe, or was it a slow process of kind of your, your throat and your chest feeling type? Those are the questions we want to find out to kind of know how did this thing come on, um, and what maybe, how can we better treat it, or rather how can the doctors better treat it? Interventions is basically what was done to try to stop the allergic reaction or try to help it. So if they already have an EpiPen, did they take their EpiPen? Um, did they take a Benadryl to try to, you know, that antihistamine action? Did they do anything? Um, did somebody around them do anything? We just want to know what has happened since then, if that may affect how we treat them. As far as treatment, um, I mean, there's not a ton we can do. <laughs> First thing, obviously, that we deal with is making sure they breathe well. So ABCs, we're talking about airway and breathing. 
Um, you want to give them oxygen right away, high concentration oxygen. So get them on a non-rebreather. As soon as you know that it's an allergic reaction, don't hesitate. Um, high flow oxygen for sure. If they're having real trouble breathing, you may actually have to get them on a BVM. Not necessarily, but again, you're going to make sure that they can breathe well, whatever it takes, basically. Um, if they have an EpiPen, an epinephrine auto injector, it may be the right course of action to take. And it's something we're going to talk about because it's kind of a big deal if you end up using that. Um, if the patient is not, okay, so if they are showing signs of shock or respiratory distress, you're pretty sure it's anaphylactic shock, you're going to move towards treating that. If they're not wheezing, if they don't have those signs of respiratory distress, um, those signs of shock, they're having an allergic reaction probably. Um, you want to keep assessing them. You want to find out more information and um, maybe talk to your medical director about using an auto-injector, but you don't want to use that EpiPen until it's absolutely positively sure that they need it. Again, it, it's actually a really powerful medicine, and you don't want to just kind of, oh, you're having an allergic reaction, maybe. Let's, let's shoot you up. Not, not a good idea. Okay. So it's really only appropriate if we know that they're allergic to something, um, if they've had exposure to that thing, and if they're now showing signs of anaphylactic shock. Um, again, that respiratory distress or the signs and symptoms of shock that we've talked about. Okay, that's an interesting, hold on. Okay, so they took out a bunch of the slides showing how to do it. Um, for an EpiPen, I don't know if y'all are going to go over that later on in the year or not, or if you already have. Um, y'all done your drug cards, right? Okay, so an EpiPen contains epinephrine. It contains a certain dose. Um, there's an adult dose and there's a child dose, and it's, it's calibrated, so you use it on a patient, and that's the full dose. You don't have to measure it, measure anything out or do anything special to it. Um, it's designed so that a patient can do it to themselves. So basically, all you, you take the cap off, you put it um, at their thigh, like in between their hip and their knee, and you like press the button and hold it for about 10 seconds. And that's essentially all that's required in order to properly administer it. After you've administered it, um, you obviously want to record that you've administered it. You want to transport your patient and you want to reassess because it's a really powerful medication. You don't want to just kind of do it casually and not bother to tell anybody. Okay. Um, if a patient has just one EpiPen, um, then some of this doesn't apply because you can only do as much as they have. You guys as EMT basics are not going to have the ability or the training to take out a vial of epinephrine and a syringe and give a proper dose. Um, so if they have extra auto injectors, tell them to bring them on the ambulance. Grab them before you go somewhere. Um, you know, you're not going to be able to help them again if they don't have those with them. You don't want to give those unless it's absolutely necessary. So you've transported them, you're reassessing them on the way to the hospital. If you see that their condition is deteriorating, so maybe those signs of um, shock haven't been reversed, if their heartbeat is still getting faster, their blood pressure is still dropping, that one dose of epinephrine potentially wasn't enough. So you'd call your medical director and see if it was possible to give another dose of epinephrine with another EpiPen. Okay. Um, if they do not have another EpiPen, or if they never had an EpiPen to begin with, you want to try to get a paramedic um, there. ALS has the training, has the equipment to actually do the syringe and vial and give them epinephrine like that, that you can't do. Okay, so now we're going to talk about epinephrine. Maybe, maybe now they are actually going to show how to deliver the dose. Okay, so epinephrine is, um, it's actually a hormone that, yeah, sorry? So you would only give epinephrine, um, we'll talk about that a little bit, but only if they're actually showing signs of anaphylactic shock. It's, it's not a last-ditch effort. I mean, it's a useful drug. Um, it's just it has severe reactions to the body, so you don't want to use it casually. But we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, epinephrine is the hormone adrenaline that your body naturally produces. It's the same name. It's the same thing. Um, so your body produces this. Have you all talked ever in other classes probably about like the fight or flight response? Have you all heard that? Okay, so 
um, adrenaline is what kind of drives that, especially the, um, the, the fight or flight side, this idea of, you know, your body gets essentially ready for action, um, is what adrenaline does. If you've been running a long way, your adrenaline is helping you with that. If you're really excited about something, adrenaline is going through your body. It's, it's a natural hormone that um, you have, and it has these effects. It's just, you know, when you're injecting it into a person, you're giving them an extra large dose. Um, so it's commonly prescribed to patients with a history of allergy, especially a history of really bad allergic reactions. Um, a lot of people have them. Generally, if they know they've got a bad allergic reaction to something, a lot of people do have EpiPens. They're kind of expensive, but um, actually they're pretty expensive. But again, you don't use them regularly. It's kind of a, not last ditch, but it's, it's an emergency only type thing. So what epinephrine or what adrenaline does is it constricts those blood vessels and it dilates those bronchioles. So it, it completely reverses the action of that allergic reaction, which constricted your breathing. Now it's dilating that back out and it dilated your blood vessels. This epinephrine is constricting it, which will help raise blood pressure, um, help make you able to breathe again, essentially reverse the things that were going really badly for you before. Okay, um, so what it does is it increases that heart rate, which overall increases your cardiac workload, and those are good things, um, but you'd want to be careful, this is where it comes in, you really want to be careful that you're giving them epinephrine when they need it, um, because if you're giving them more than they really need, or if you're giving it before they actually need this EpiPen, um, you're going to put a lot of extra stress on their heart that isn't necessary. If they're not at that point of actually requiring epinephrine, then um, you're actually putting your patient in danger by giving them EpiPen because it's going to increase that heart rate. It's going to make that heart work a lot harder. Um, in patients that already have cardiac problems, this is no bueno. Um, and like I said, increase that cardiac workload. It's just making it work harder, potentially unnecessarily. So you have to be aware when you're giving this drug that if they don't actually need it yet, or again, EpiPen has only one dose in it, you can't alter that. So if the dose in the EpiPen is too high for your patient, you've got to be aware that you may actually be sending them into the opposite direction and you may be causing more problems for them. Okay, um, one second. We're going to talk a little bit about how to inject it. I'm hoping you'll talk about dosage later. Um, so the auto-injector itself is a spring-loaded needle and a syringe with a single dose of epinephrine. Um, take the cap off, when you inject it, the medication automatically goes inside your patient, is injected into their muscle. It's given intramuscularly, I am. Um, you typically inject it, like I said, somewhere halfway between the waist and like the hip, or excuse me, the waist and like the knee down here, um, in the meaty part of the thigh is what you're going for. Because it doesn't go into the bloodstream, it goes into the muscle. Has anyone ever seen somebody have to get EpiPinned? Your brother? What's he allergic to? <coughs> to like and beef. Okay, okay. So he has really strong reactions to those. Okay. Um, you want to remove the clothing if possible, but it's not super necessary. The needle inside an EpiPen is really strong and sharp. So it'll go through clothing, generally speaking, without much of a problem. If they're wearing really thick jeans or something like that, I mean, it's going to be easier if you don't have to go through clothing. But, um, but you can do it through clothing. It's meant to be as easy as possible. Use standard precautions, so BSI, put on gloves. Um, when you actually do it, you take off the cap, you press the tip of it um, against the patient's thigh, and you, you just press the button, and it sends the medication in. Like I said, you want to hold it there for a few seconds, about 10 seconds to be safe, to make sure all the medication goes into your patient and none of it's left. And then, obviously, because it's got a sharp end, you discard it into a sharps container. Okay, this is what I was talking about with dosage. So the adult dose of epinephrine in an EpiPen is 0.3 milligrams. Pediatric dose is half that, 0.15 milligrams. Um, the cutoff for children versus adult, it talks about weight here. Um, some of that's just a judgment call because you can't always know that. So usually, though, well, rather always, they'll have their own EpiPen. You don't carry it yourself to give to a patient. If the patient has an EpiPen, you use that person's EpiPen, whatever whatever they have with them. Okay, the reason why, I'll talk about that for a sec, the reason why we don't carry EpiPens on an ambulance usually um, is because 
like I talked about, um, using EpiPens is kind of dangerous on your patient. So you don't want to make a lot of assumptions about a given patient. If they haven't been prescribed an EpiPen, then um, it's not safe. If they have been prescribed an EpiPen, then that means they've seen a doctor who said, yes, you have um, allergic reactions that are severe enough to need an EpiPen. Yes, you're in good enough health that an EpiPen is not going to hurt you really badly. And so that's why they'll have one with them. If they don't have one with them, you don't risk it. You don't. What if it's like expired? Um, if it's expired, you don't want to use it on them either. But and do you have put one that you have on? No. No, you only use the patient's own EpiPens on them. And so if there isn't a good one with you, if you don't have one or they don't have, I mean, if they don't have one or if it's expired, um, then you would call for ALS, call for a paramedic team to help you out. Um, you just don't want to mess with that stuff. Expired medications, you don't ever give to a patient. So, Any other questions about epinephrine, EpiPens? Okay. Um, I know you all have, well, most of you all have done your drug cards. Do you all remember any of the um, indications and contraindications of epinephrine? It raises your heart, like your heart rate. Yeah, so side effects definitely. Um, raised heart rate, you can talk about heading, um, headache, dizziness, um, raised heart rate. What else? Any others that you remember? Well, she listed side effects, but also indications and contraindications. What do you all remember from the drug card, basically? Chest pain. Okay, are you saying it can cause chest pain? Yeah, it can cause chest pain. Um, hypotension would not be a contraindication, though, because it's actually meant to raise your blood pressure up. Um, in reality, there are no real contraindications for use of emergency epinephrine. The only possible reason why you wouldn't give somebody an EpiPen is if they're allergic to the other chemicals that are in EpiPen. And if they are allergic to those things, um, their doctor wouldn't have prescribed it anyway. So they're not going to have one if they're allergic to it. Because actual epinephrine, you can't be allergic to. Your body makes it. But when it's in an EpiPen, it's not pure epinephrine. There's a few other bits and pieces in there. And there's a chance somebody can be allergic somehow to those. Um, but in reality, in an emergency setting, there's no reason, if they have an EpiPen and they really need one, there's no contraindications. You give it to them. Um, indications would be what? Anaphylactic shock. shock, right. So um, we're talking about those signs of shock, the hypotension, things like that, respiratory distress. If you're seeing that, they have anaphylactic shock. If they have an EpiPen, you give them one. Okay. Is that it? Yep, that's it. Any questions? Yes. So if they have an EpiPen, you just give it to them. Like, you don't have to call the medical director to ask if you can. Okay, good question. That would depend pretty much on who you worked for. Um, usually speaking, they still want you to call because that overall permission to use the EpiPen does kind of need to be dictated by a doctor, and that's who your medical control is. Uh, it would really depend on the protocols of who you worked for. So if you're working on an ambulance and they have written down in their protocols um, that it's okay to use an EpiPen if you are seeing signs of anaphylactic shock, then that's okay. Usually most places, yeah, you're going to call medical control and describe what you're seeing, describe enough that they know what's going on, and they're going to say, yes, okay. If your patient has an EpiPen, give it to them. Do you all know the difference between online and offline medical control? Okay. Do you know? You do? I see like one person. Okay. Um, online medical control is when you're actually talking to your medical director or somebody who represents them. Um, basically, you are online with them. Offline is just your protocols, things that are found in your like, books of procedures. So when it mentioned online medical control for giving extra doses, that's one thing you would definitely call the medical director for and make sure that it's okay to give another dose based on what you've seen and what you've given. Any other questions about allergic reactions, um, anaphylactic shock, epinephrine, anything else? Okay. Okay, so we are next going to go over um, poisoning and overdose emergencies that you may see as an EMT. Okay. A um, couple of vocabulary words like before. A poison is any substance that can harm the body, just in general. So um, 
not necessarily only the things you think of as poison, but if it is dangerous to the body, it is a poison. We'll talk about some of those that might surprise you. The harm that a poison can cause um, can result in a medical emergency in some cases. So you may see some of these things. Uh, there's a quote, all things are poison and nothing is without poison. Only the dose permits something not to be poisonous. So I don't know who Paracelsus is, but it's true. Um, you know, the drugs you take for your headache are not poisonous up to a certain point. But um, if you take too many Tylenol, actually even just a little bit too much Tylenol, um, it can actually cause major liver problems and it can kill you. So just don't increase the dose of Tylenol if that's one of the things that you take. Just a side note. Um, alcohol is like okay in moderation, but too much is, will kill you. It's a poison. It damages your body, damages your liver, all kinds of things. What's that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, like too much at once, they call it alcohol poisoning. But, you know, over time, people have cirrhosis of the liver, scarring, and their liver stops working, bad things. Okay, common poisons. Um, medications. So I was, I was saying acetaminophen, Tylenol. Um, the dose, the, the working dose of Tylenol is actually not that much less than the toxic dose of Tylenol. Um, it can be, I mean, some people take it accidentally. They just have a headache and the little bit they took isn't working, so they take a couple more extra strength. And um, if you do that over the course of a few days, it builds up in your liver and it can kill you actually fairly quickly. So if you have a headache, don't take too much acetaminophen, like fill up on a leave or Advil or something like that. Um, petroleum products, cosmetics, pesticides, plants, food poisoning. Um, a lot of things are poisonous, so you don't want to ingest them if you can help it or get close to them like gasoline, um, things like that, or petroleum products. Plants, um, did anyone ever see the movie White Oleander? It was like, it's been like 10 years since they came out. Okay, oleander's a poisonous plant, so the whole movie revolves around the fact that oleander is poisonous, but um, holly berries are poisonous. There's a lot of those that are poisonous if you eat them. I think, what is it, um, poinsettias are like poisonous to cats or something? Yeah. yeah. So. I have a cat. Okay. <laughs> Effects of a poison. So harm to the body, obviously. We said a poison is anything that can harm the body. Um, the effect of a poison is that it harms the body. That depends on what kind of poison it is, how much of it they take, um, how they took this poison. There's different methods of um, being affected by one the patient's age and health and other conditions that may have to do with this patient. Um, poisons can damage the skin or whatever it contacts, whether that's inside the body or like external on the skin. Um, can cause you to suffocate, can cause damage either over the entire body or just to specific body systems or specific organs. Um, it really depends on the poison. Like we said, there's a lot of them out there. Okay, so we classify poisons by the way that you can be... Um, route of entry, the way you can be affected by them. Ingested poisons, which means you ate them, you drank them, something like that. They went in your mouth. Inhaled poisons, so you breathed them in. Absorbed, meaning like through the skin somehow. Um, certain things could be absorbed through the skin. And then injected poisons. When we talk about injected poisons, we're talking about either usually actually injected like from a syringe. Um, often we're talking about drugs. Uh, it can also be injected poisons are like snake bite, like venom, things like that, are technically injected into the body, and they're poisons, poisonous as well. Okay, so ingested poisons. For children, these are, you know, pretty much accidental. Um, you see a lot of those, like, poison control things on household chemicals and stuff because children can accidentally eat or drink something toxic, especially if it looks appealing if it's like this bright blue chemical in a bottle they don't know what it is they don't read it it just looks pretty um and it turns out it's like bleach or something terrible and you know that's a poison obviously um for adults it can be accidental it can also be deliberate overdose especially of medication or something like that okay so this assessment for poisons we basically do for any type of poison we're going to run through it a few times over the course of this um, slideshow. When we talk about a poison, we're trying to assess what happened. We first want to look at what substance was involved, um, whether it was ingested, inhaled, whatever. What is it that they are poisoned by? 
So you want to look for whatever container, if there's something out or nearby. Sometimes it'll be obvious, sometimes it won't. Um, look for the label, try to find as much information about it as you can. And if you're transporting this patient to the hospital, you want to bring with them whatever they were poisoned by. As long as it's not something that's going to be harmful for you to transport, but I mean, if it's, if it's a jar of bleach, if it's a bottle of medication, you want to bring it with you so that the doctors can really know how to help the patient. Um, if you don't actually, if you can't bring it with you, then you just want to write down as clearly as possible the exact substance, the exact spelling, exact, if it's like medication, the exact dosage, anything like that, anything that would help them understand what exactly has happened to this patient. You'd also want to look at when exposure occurred. Um, so some things happen, some things affect the body quickly and some are more slow. If you're taking a whole bunch of um, antidepressant pills, you know, eventually it's going to cause issues in your body, but it's not going to be like instantaneous that you take the fifth one and, oh, that's too much, and your body immediately starts having problems. It's a slow process. Versus if a child drinks bleach, it's going to happen a little bit faster. You're going to start to see signs right away and things that you want to try to help with. Um, knowing when it occurred helps you know what kind of treatment needs to be provided, helps um, the people in the ER know just in general how to better help this patient. You also want to know how much um, was taken. Again, if it's ingested, inhaled, whatever. Generally speaking, you want to know how much of the poison they got. So if, um, if it's a bottle of pills and it was, it was a new prescription and there were supposed to be 30 pills in there and there's now only 10 pills in there, you can pretty easily assume they probably took about 20 pills um, close to it. If it's, you know, whatever, whatever you can assume by perhaps the spills around the person or... Maybe they can tell you how much they took or how much they saw their child drink or something like that. You want to know how much was taken because it will, again, better help you understand how to treat the person or what your options are. Um, you want to know how, over how long a time the poison was taken, um, especially if it's medication. Sometimes people will, sometimes it's an overdose that they just took way too much at once. Sometimes it's more of a gradual thing that they were taking too much for their body to process and eventually the effects of that chronic medication um, have accumulated, have accumulated and become something poisonous for their body and it's affecting them. Uh, you want to know what interventions have been taken. So um, if they tried to make the person vomit, if they gave the person like something to drink to try to dilute it, um, lists here syrup of Ipecac. Has anyone ever heard or seen what that is? No. Okay. It's, um, it is an old tiny medication that they used to give to try to make somebody throw up. Um, it, it's not that it's ineffective, um, but it's not as effective as things that we can do nowadays. So generally speaking, we don't use it, but some people in their homes may still have syrup of, of Ipecac and it, they might've tried to use it to help induced vomiting. Um, a lot of substances have on their poison control labels, they'll say, you know, flush eyes with water or do not induce vomiting or whatever. They'll have listed things that you're supposed to do or not supposed to do. And so you want to find out from the people around them or that person themselves, did you do any of these things? What did you do to try to help somehow with this poisoning? Um, we want to find out the patient's weight because the amount that is required for something to be toxic depends on weight, usually. So, um, or at the very least, how much it will affect them. Just like somebody who's been drinking, a tiny person can't handle as much alcohol as like a big burly guy who drinks all the time. That's just the way their bodies process it, the, the body weight that they have affects that. So, it's important with all poisons. Um, we also want to know what effects your patient has experienced. Some common ones that you might expect to see with an ingested poison are nausea and vomiting, um, altered mental status, abdominal pain, uh, diarrhea, chemical burns around the mouth, especially if it's some sort of caustic substance. When I say caustic, we're meaning like a corrosive, something that causes irritation and damage to the skin. So if they swallowed bleach, you'd expect to see chemical burns around the mouth, something like that. Um, unusual breath odors might happen if they've ingested a poison. And you'd want to try to notice whether they've experienced those, if they have noticed those, or also if you see those on a particular patient. Food poisoning 
can be caused by improperly handled or prepared food. Um, I'm sure everyone in here has had food poisoning at one time in their life. I know I have. Um, it's no fun. Nausea, vomiting, abdominal cramps, diarrhea, fever. Um, it can happen quickly. It can take more time. It, I wouldn't say it usually passes. It kind of depends what, what the issue was. Food poisoning is caused by um, germs, essentially, that have grown in the food. So, or, or things that were added to the food that shouldn't have been there kind of thing. For food poisoning, um, some substances have antidotes. Not a whole lot do, but some do, and you can give those if you know what they took and you know you have an antidote. For a lot of things, especially organic uh, poisons they've ingested, you give activated charcoal, which have you all seen this bottle yet? Okay, so I'm pretty sure there's slides in here that talk about it later, what you do, but this is activated charcoal. Um, activated charcoal works through ad adsorption, allowing substances to attach to the surface. So regular charcoal, regular charcoal does this as well, but activated charcoal that's like this is specifically in a solution to make it easier for that person to ingest. Um, and it's been um, altered, basically, so it has a whole lot more surface area, activated charcoal. So it can absorb or adsorb a whole lot more substances with all that extra surface area. It is not an antidote. Basically what it does is it tries to take those toxins out of what a person has ingested and then it makes them throw those up. So it doesn't neutralize the effects of whatever's inside them. It just tries to remove as much as possible of whatever they've taken. Um, okay, um, public education. These are some things you may have seen. Um, child-proofing homes, I mean, I'm, I don't know, I've seen this kind of stuff, I've seen it talked about. Mr. Yuck is like that sticker with the, the face that looks like, like whatever, like it got his tongue sticking out, uh, that they put on bottles of like chemicals and things, and I don't know, if you, if you Google Mr. Yuck, you'll see the face, but it's like, it's one of those big, um, are you Googling right now? Okay. It's one of those big campaigns that they tried to do to make it clear to kids, like, this is gross. Because um, a lot of public education about poisons is There's geared towards song. children. There's a song, a Mr. Yuck song. Can I play it? Okay, you can play the song. Okay, I'm going to play it. Which Chinese? How long is this song? It's almost done. Okay. Okay, so Mr. Yuck has a song. Um, he is mean. No, seriously, the, the stickers are green, and they're like the gross face. And so I, got, I didn't know there was a song that went with it, but it's the whole thing of like making sure kids know, don't eat this, drink this, whatever. It's bad for you. It'll make you sick. Now we all know. Mr. Yuck. Where is everyone going? Okay. Okay. Um, inhaled poisons is what we're going to talk about next. Um, some common inhaled poisons are carbon monoxide, ammonia, um, chlorine gas, agricultural chemicals and pesticides, and carbon dioxide. Is I mean, technically poisonous as well, depending on the concentration of it. Um, when we're talking about inhaled poisons, there's a high risk that they may still be in the air. Obviously, if your patient inhaled them, you might inhale them as well. So first off is your own personal safety, scene safety. 
Um, if you're not trained or if you don't have the equipment to properly enter a scene where there was an inhaled poison, you know, wait until somebody who does have that training and equipment comes in and is able to safely take your patient out or safely clear the scene. Um, you may need to have some sort of, or the person, not really you guys, but whoever is that's dealing with these patients will need to have protective clothing, breathing apparatus potentially, to make sure they don't also inhale this poison that um, the patient inhaled. When we talk about inhaled poisons, some things we might see are difficulty breathing, chest pain, um, coughing, hoarse, hoarse voice, headache, confusion, altered mental status. You might see seizures. Um, it, depending on the poison and how much it's affected them. And again, for your assessment, it's sort of similar to what we did for ingested poisons. So we want to know what exactly is involved. Get the exact name, the exact spelling, whatever. Um, when did the exposure occur? Over how long did that exposure occur? So if it's carbon monoxide, you'd want to try to figure out when they started noticing or when um, that carbon monoxide probably entered their system or their environment, how long ago that was, over how much time they had that entered in their environment. Um, again, what interventions has anyone taken? What effects are they experiencing? Um, you'd want to find out if the patient was removed from the scene and how, how long they were exposed to that poison before they were removed from the scene. Has the area been ventilated? These kind of questions would help you better understand what treatment the patient needs, as well as overall what's going on with your scene. As far as treating the patient, you want to make sure that they are moved away from the unsafe environment. Um, again, only if you are trained and equipped to do so, otherwise you get somebody else to take care of it. You open their airway, you provide high flow oxygen, non-rebreather or potentially BVM if they're not breathing well for themselves by that point. You'd want to go ahead and get a history, uh, physical exam, vital signs. Want to, if you know what the substance is and you have a label or a container of it, something like that, you'd want to go ahead and transport those along with you um, and continue your assessment en route. Usually just removing them from this unsafe environment where they've inhaled a poison will often help, especially if it's something like carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, uh, ammonia or chlorine gas, something where they can easily be removed from it. Carbon monoxide poisoning. Does anyone in their homes have a carbon monoxide monitor? Like, I know a lot of y'all probably have um, smoke detectors in your homes. Does anybody have? It's usually like a box like this. Yeah. Okay. Um, carbon monoxide is a colorless, odorless, tasteless gas. It's created by combustion, so things burning, basically. Um, wood fire, like wood stoves, uh, fireplaces, portable heaters, generators. Um, people who are trying to commit suicide occasionally will do the whole, like, hose from your exhaust pipe into your car because it produces a lot of carbon monoxide. It's a, it's a relatively painless way to go because it is not a gas that causes any sort of discomfort. It just it kills you. It suffocates you, essentially. Um, the reason that it suffocates you is because, well, I'm assuming there's a... Okay, yeah, it talks here about how carbon monoxide bonds a whole lot more strongly to red blood cells than oxygen does. So that's why it's so um, easy to die that way, basically. Signs and symptoms of carbon monoxide poisoning. A uh, headache, first and foremost. They may talk about like it feeling like it's a band around their head. Dizziness, nausea, breathing difficulty, um, cyanosis. Again, they're essentially suffocating. They're breathing, but they're not breathing in oxygen. So they're not getting the effects of oxygen. You'll often see carbon monoxide, or you may see carbon monoxide poisoning in multiple patients. Um, if you see these signs and the patient has been in an enclosed space, or maybe there's multiple people all with the same signs in one space, you should suspect carbon monoxide poisoning because um, those are the times and places that it more frequently happens. Um, you may, on your crew, if you're on an ambulance, you may actually have a device that shows you how much carbon monoxide is in the air, for sure, fire teams do, um, to, discern, to determine the level of carbon monoxide in the field. Um, okay, I already talked about carbon monoxide detectors. Definitely, they're important to have in the home. They're not that expensive. Yes? No, no. If, um, 
if you suspect that there's been carbon monoxide poisoning, you wouldn't want to go in there unless you're sure that you're going to be safe. So um, generally speaking, you'd have, for example, firefighters bringing the patients out or something like that because um, they have the breathing apparatus, they have the protective gear to make sure they don't also inhale it. And then once they're out and away from where the poison is, you can help them effectively. Okay, so like I said, high flow oxygen is what you need to give them. Um, carbon monoxide bonds to red blood cells more strongly than oxygen does. So usually oxygen is going to have a big effect. It's going to help them, but, um, but you need to give it as soon as you can. It'll take a while to get all the carbon monoxide out of that person's bloodstream because of that affinity. Um, they may also, one common poison that people may inhale is smoke. Um, this doesn't just have carbon monoxide in it. It may, but it'll also have other things in there. Ammonia, chlorine, cyanide, depending what was burned, um, things like that. These substances can irritate the skin and eyes. They can damage your lungs. Um, they can cause respiratory failure, cardiac arrest. Really bad deal. If somebody has inhaled smoke, the things you might see, difficulty breathing and coughing, again, um, kind of a smoky or a chemical smell on their breath because they've inhaled it into their lungs. Um, they may have kind of a black sputum, which means in their spit and stuff, you might see black in their mouth and their nose as well. And then um, singed facial hair. So singed, like slightly burnt, basically. Those are all signs that somebody might have been exposed to a lot of smoke. Uh, if somebody has inhaled smoke, again, you want to remove them to a safe area making sure that you are safe as well while you do this. Keep their airway open, give them oxygen, and monitor them closely. Uh, often a side issue that comes along with smoke inhalation is burns to the airway. So you want to make sure that the airway doesn't swell and swell shut. Okay. Um, detergent suicides are something we have a slide about. It's a method of suicide started in Japan and it's becoming more common in the U.S., at least according to your book. Um, basically, it's releasing this hydrogen sulfide gas, um, mixing a couple chemicals you can easily have at home. It's, it's a way, I mean, it doesn't happen accidentally, pretty much. It's a way people try to kill themselves. Um, something that would still be really dangerous if you came in and inhaled it yourself while you were trying to help a patient. Um, you may need to treat the scene as a hazardous area, as a hazmat scene, because of the chemical, the hydrogen sulfide gas that's around them. So again, your personal safety is incredibly important if you suspect this. Okay, absorbed poisons. Um, they can be absorbed through the skin. They may or may not cause damage to the skin. Some things easily go through the skin. Um, with no problems. Some things, um, like agricultural chemicals, a lot of stuff, they'll go through the skin and they'll also cause an effect on the skin itself. The other patient may require decontamination of their skin before you can treat them, again, to keep yourself safe. When you suspect an absorbed poison, um, you assess for immediate life threats. Again, you want to check for their history, physical exam, vital signs. Um, you want to try to get whatever it is that was on their skin off their skin. So if it's some sort of powder, you want to try to get rid of that first. You don't want to add water to it because there's some powders, some chemicals that in their powderized form aren't super harmful to you, but if you add water, they can cause really bad chemical burns. So get the powder off, then irrigate the area with water to try to get rid of whatever is clinging to their skin that has poisoned them. Um, if it's something in their eyes, you, again, flush out with water trying to get rid of it. Transport them with whatever you think might have caused this poisoning and um, continue your reassessment as you transport. Pretty much the same as it's been for all poisons. Poison control centers. Um, on just about every poisonous substance that comes in a bottle or a jar or something like that, there is um, information for poison control centers. It's an 800 number. And there's also information about what to do if you do ingest it or get it in your eyes or whatever the issue is. Um, if you call the poison control center, they can give you a lot extra information about how to deal with a certain poison, um, what it might look like, how to treat it, things like that. Even more than your local hospital will. The poison control centers know what they're doing. Okay, 
alcohol and substance abuse. Um, these are technically usually ingested poisons, sometimes injected poisons, depending what the substance is. And this, they have their own little section. Okay, as an EMT, you're probably going to see quite a few patients who um, suffer from some degree of alcohol or substance abuse problems. Um, a lot of conditions are either caused directly by those things or are related somehow to um, the fact that they are abusers of alcohol or some sort of drug. Um, alcohol and substance abusers can, you know, they're not just poor, they're not just from a certain ethnicity, it's across the board. So don't make assumptions about your patients based on what they look like or what you may expect of a certain patient. Alcohol is a drug. Um, it affects the central nervous system. It can be addictive. Um, you know, you can, a patient can have an issue of alcohol poisoning, like y'all mentioned, where they've taken a whole bunch in a short amount of time. Um, it can be more of a chronic problem. I was talking about cirrhosis of the liver and overall problems from continued use, overuse of alcohol. Um, if you have a patient that you suspect alcohol is an issue um, that you're dealing with, Treat your patient just like you treat any other patient. Again, your, your book spends a little bit of time talking about this, but basically it's real easy in the field to kind of become callous to problems that you see a lot. Um, if you see a lot of patients that deal with alcohol or substance abuse problems, it's really easy to kind of dismiss that um, and not treat them as well as you should or as just as if they're any other patient. And so that's something to be careful of in yourself as you're treating those patients. Usually if somebody has abused alcohol, they're probably abusing other substances as well. Um, other drugs or things like that. So it's not just the alcohol that you have to watch out for. It's the combination of different substances that can cause a really serious medical emergency. Um, if a patient has abused alcohol, you may see that they're combative. They're uncooperative. They may fight you. Um, you may require law enforcement to make sure that you can safely deal with a patient without yourself getting hurt or in trouble. Um, it's, it's important to note, though, that there's a lot of conditions out there that can look like alcohol abuse or that can look like intoxication that aren't. Um, they may have some of the same signs that look like they're drunk, but they may have other issues. Can anybody think of some of those? Diabetes is one for sure. It causes a lot of the same issues if they're having a diabetic emergency. Anything else? Head trauma can cause a lot of that same altered mental status and things like that. The vomiting, some of those signs that you might expect to see. Um, if somebody is epileptic and has seizures, they might be acting in a similar kind of altered mental status type way. Um, so you don't want to just assume that because somebody looks drunk that they are. Um, and at the same time, they may actually be drunk, but they may also have other medical problems. That's why we emphasize this idea that you treat them like a regular patient. Don't assume that, oh, well, they're just drunk. They're fine. Not necessarily. You really want to look at them and evaluate them properly from a medical standpoint. So things that you might see with alcohol abuse. Alcohol odor on the breath. Uh, um, unsteady on the feet, not being able to keep their balance well. Slurred speech. Um, flushing flushed skin, nausea, vomiting, poor coordination, uh, blurred vision, and then confusion or altered mental status are all things. They're not just signs that you would see with alcohol abuse, but they are a lot of the signs that you might see with alcohol abuse or intoxication. Um, at the same time, you may also see different signs if a person is addicted to alcohol and is undergoing withdrawal. For whatever reason, they don't have it or they're maybe somehow trying to stop or something like that. If, they, if they're addicted to alcohol and they all of a sudden stop drinking it, um, it may cause delirium tremens, which is shaking, basically. Tremors, um, hallucinations can cause seizures if their withdrawal is really severe. Um, other things you may see with alcohol withdrawal, confusion and restlessness, unusual behavior, um, what, you know, what we might think of as insane behavior, we're talking about hallucinations and tremors and things like that, a lot of sweating, you may see seizures. Uh, these are things to keep in mind. 
Okay, so if you suspect that your patient um, has abused alcohol and that's one of their issues that you're having to address, you should expect that they're going to throw up. Um, so protect yourself. Not just gloves, potentially more to protect your skin, your clothing, whatever. I mean, you don't want that on you. That's pretty gross. Um, you want to have suction ready. If they're throwing up, there's a good likelihood that their airway could be partially obstructed by the vomit, so you want to make sure to clear that away. Keep their airway open as much as possible. Uh, respiratory problems as well. One of the effects of alcohol is that it depresses the central nervous system, which includes slowing down breathing and things like that. Um, so you'd want to stay alert and see if there's any airway or respiratory problems. Keep monitoring those vital signs. Um, watch out for seizures and try to find as much as you can about this patient, whether from them or from their family or bystanders, anybody who's around that could help you figure out maybe if there's another issue, that it's not just alcohol, that it's also something else. We talked about those other potential conditions. Okay, talking about substance abuse. When we say substance abuse, we mean any chemical substance taken for other than a medical reason. Okay, so this can be things that are actually illegal drugs, it can also be things that are completely legal, prescription medications, over-the-counter medications, chemicals. If they're still being used in a way that is not the way they were intended for, it's considered substance abuse. Um, talking about the different types, we have uppers, which basically affect the nervous system kind of... Um, talking about cocaines, amphetamines, different ways to take those. We also have downers, which depress the central nervous system. Um, a couple ones listed, barbiturates, rohypnol, which is refuse the date rape drug, and GHB um, is another type of downer that your book lists. Narcotics are usually um, used to relieve pain or to help with sleep. With these we talk about like opiates, um, opium-related drugs like heroin, codeine, which is one of those prescribed drugs, but it can be um, definitely abused, morphine, same thing. Oxycodone, hydrocodone, um, those are all narcotics. Has anyone ever had to have like a really big surgery and been um, prescribed one of those drugs? Okay, what'd they give you? I don't know, but it made me feel not muscle. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. So, I mean, Definitely, narcotics are prescribed. Um, they're kept under very close lock and key. Like, not every doctor can prescribe them. It's, um, it's definitely more of a watched process because they can be abused so easily. Um, and there's a lot of people who are addicted to Oxy or something like that. I was only allowed to take them for like two and a half weeks. And then I had to get off. So. Mm -hmm. um, my husband had massive wrist surgery, actually two summers in a row, because first because he like shattered it, and then because he had to have like reconstructive yeah, taking the pins out, pins. and they gave him hydrocodone, and um, after just about three days of taking it, he, when, he, when we started weaning him back off, he um, had a little bit of withdrawal symptoms, because it, it happens that fast. They're super addictive drugs. I don't think I have that. I don't think I have that like, withdrawal symptoms. Yeah. Because I only took them like, I think I only took them like twice a day. Mm-hmm. When I had knee surgery, I, it, I had arthroscopic knee surgery, so they just put in the scopes and scraped away some cartilage that was torn. Um, and they gave me Percocet, I think. And so it's, it's, an, it's a narcotic, but it's not as bad or it's not as strong as some. They scraped my bone, take my bone. People can also abuse the, the class of drugs known as hallucinogens, um, LSD, PCP, and ecstasy are the ones they want you to know. Okay, volatile chemicals. These are chemicals that give off vapor that is then inhaled. Um, they first give a rush, and then they act as a central nervous system depressant. So this is why, like, you can't buy Sharpies under age 18 anymore. Um, and why they care, yeah. Yeah. Well, okay, sometimes they may not check, but they're supposed to. Um, why they are careful about, like, spray paint that they sell. Um, yeah. Uh, because they're chemicals that, or like some, some glues, things with certain chemicals that give off a lot of vapors are used this way. And so now there's a lot of restrictions. Mm -hmm. Some of the weirdest things you can't buy anymore. Don't you have to be a certain age to buy like 
bed because right. it's used for meth or something like that? Uh, you ha yeah, they, they don't have that over the counter like on the shelves anymore. You have to go up to the pharmacist and ask for it. Yeah. Uh, because of when we were talking about uppers, it can be used to make methamphetamine. Yeah. For what? Sudafed. Or, or drugs like it. Yep. I don't know why. I, I <laughs> sure. <laughs> okay. Have y'all seen? Um, there, there were a few news articles about it, like maybe a week ago. The it's a drug that came over from Russia, or it's a type of drug like um, crocodile or crocodile. Yeah. yeah. What what they do is they basically mix together a whole bunch of household ingredients, um, and what they've what they produce is a drug that has like terrible like corrosive substances that like literally eat away at your body but they inject it into themselves and it essentially causes um gangrene like their skin just rots like the flesh just rots off it's it's terrible so like the bath salts that were gone like a guy that took like the bath salts and then he like ate that other guy yeah some of that stuff i don't even know but this drug they say from the time that you get hooked you have about a year to two years before you die. It's just, it's that addictive and it's that harmful for your body. Because it gives you a high, but it's a really, really short lived high. And in the meantime, you're ingesting, like, or you're injecting like arsenic and all kinds of like really terrible chemicals for your body just straight into your bloodstream. What gave them, like, what made them want to make it? Because it's cheap. And if you're looking for a high, it's something you can make yourself and it's cheap. But why would you do that? It doesn't last very long. Because if you want to hide that bad, you don't care. That's dumb. Obviously, you've never been a drug addict. That is so dumb. <laughs> I mean, I don't know, but the people who are in those situations, they make those choices and um, they can't fight the urge, I guess. I, I don't know. I, I can't justify it. <laughs> All drugs kill you eventually to some degree. I mean, maybe it's a lot slower, maybe never like that bad, but... That's just a more like intense, immediate version of what all drugs will do eventually. You know, if you're shooting up cocaine regularly, you're going to be messing yourself up too. One of my friends' sister shot up cocaine. Like I had a friend who took too many shrooms and died. So like that stuff happens. So drugs are bad, you guys. Okay, drugs are bad. Okay. Um, so if you suspect substance abuse in a patient, um, the assessment's going to be probably a little bit more difficult than some other types of poisons um, because a lot of these affect level of consciousness in your patients. And they may have taken more than one drug, more than one type of drug. So sometimes it's a little bit harder to figure out what really has happened. Also, because a lot of these drugs are illegal, they're not just going to produce a bottle for you and say, oh, this is what it is and this was the dosage and whatever. Like... It's going to be a little bit harder to, to figure out what has happened with your patient. Um, you can probably expect your patient to be uncooperative or even combative, just like with alcohol. Um, and you need to be aware, for scene safety's sake, that there may be issues around you. If they used a needle, that needle's probably contaminated. That needle probably wasn't disposed of in a sharps container, okay? So you need to look around for it. Be aware of what's around you, um, again, to keep yourself safe in these kind of situations especially. Okay, so signs and symptoms of each of the drugs we're going to talk about real quick. For downers, um, which we talked about um, some of the options, you're going to see sluggishness, poor coordination. Remember we said this decreases your central nervous system's responses. So you're going to see a decrease in pulse and respirations. Um, the downers were like, like roofies and, and stuff like that. Uppers, so methamphetamines, cocaine, the, or yeah, those types of drugs. Um, you're going to see excitement, restlessness, an increased pulse, increased respirations. Um, you're going to see sweating. You're going to see hyperthermia. Their body has just gone into overdrive, and it's producing a lot of extra heat, and it's trying to get rid of that. You may see that they haven't slept in a while if they've kind of been on a continuous high of whatever drug they've taken. Um, these are things to look out for to ask about. Narcotics, if they have taken nar narcotics, you're going to see... Um, what we call the opiate triad, kind of the name for these three symptoms that we usually see, which are pinpoint pupils. Their pupils get very, very small, very constricted. Um, respiratory depression, meaning that they don't breathe much. And then coma, or um, very low level of consciousness. Did anybody ever see, um, what was the movie, Flight? The one with Denzel Washington. It was like a year or two ago it came out. Okay, well, never mind then. There's a, did you? 
Okay, do you remember the scene where the, the girl shoots up and you it like zooms in on her pupils and her pupils get super small? Okay, that's fine. There is a scene like that in there anyway. It shows that really clearly. She shoots up with heroin and it zooms into her face and her pupils literally go from like normal to like pinpricks in her eyes, like almost completely blue, very, very tiny pupils. That's what narcotics will do. Heroin, codeine, the other ones that were listed. Um, they'll have that effect if you overdose. You may also see cool skin and lethargy. The patient may be very sleepy or, like I said, even go into like a coma-type state. Hallucinogens. You may see rapid pulse, dilated pupils, um, a flushed face. They may report seeing or hearing things that aren't actually there. They may be having hallucinations. Um, these are things you should take into account because a lot of the time patients that are like this are going to be combative um, they may see things that aren't really there and try to attack them, and then the process hurt you. So be very aware. Um, try to be calming. Try to keep yourself safe while you're dealing with a patient that you suspect has been on one of these drugs. Have you ever dealt with someone like that? Not personally, no, thankfully. I've dealt with patients who have schizophrenia and sometimes sort of similar um, external, but, but no, never, never with these drugs like that, no. Um, a patient who has taken those volatile chemicals we talked about, where they're inhaling the vapors that the whatever chemical produces, you might see them being dazed and disoriented, that altered mental status um, related to the high and related to what they've just inhaled. You may see swollen membranes or just a different look in their nose or their mouth um, from irritation of whatever they've inhaled. Again, it's not good for them. Otherwise, it'd be legal. So watch out for that. You may see that as a sign. They may um, actually have some residue of that chemical on their face, or they may still have a bag with some residue of that chemical inside of it. Um, so look for that. It'll help you maybe understand. You can bring it with you, and hopefully um, somebody will be able to identify what's gone wrong or what they've taken. You're going to see some changes in their heart rhythm kind of depending on what it is that they've taken or what they've inhaled. Um, and they may also have some sort of numb numbness or tingling kind of sensation that they report. So, all that being said, if you have a patient that you suspect has um, abused some sort of substance, be aware, first and foremost, airway breathing. So you want to make sure the airway stays open. You want to make sure they don't go into respiratory distress. Get them on oxygen. If necessary, actually help breathe for them. If they've taken one of those drugs that really depresses the respiratory system, you don't want to just depend on them being able to breathe enough for themselves. You may need to treat them for shock. Um, we talked about shock, that hyperperfusion, that uh, pale, cool, clammy skin. Keep them warm. Try to keep their blood flowing to the important parts of their body. Um, talk to the patient. Try to keep them calm and cooperative, especially if they're already combative or uh, are really disoriented and maybe not doing so well. You may need to get law enforcement in to help with that. Um, when you're doing the physical exam, you need to be looking for evidence of how they took this substance. So like we talked about, if they've inhaled something, you might see it. Um, if they have injected themselves with something, you'll probably see some track marks. You might see a history of substance abuse that you can kind of notice based on what you see physically in your patient. Uh, you want to go ahead and transport them as soon as possible. There's not a lot you can do for them personally. You can basically just get a lot of information, and then keep them breathing. So you want to get them to the hospital as quickly as you can. Um, call your medical control and try to find out if there's anything else you can do for this patient. Talk to law enforcement if you need help restraining your patient or dealing with them from that standpoint to keep yourself safe. And just get them to the hospital as quickly as possible. Okay. Questions? Y'all kind of perked up right there at the end with substance abuse. Okay. Mm -hmm.